So today, we're, we left off Mark's Gospel before Advent at the end of chapter 10. So today we're going um, back to, to Mark's Gospel, Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. Hence the ferns, as you'll see when we get to it. So Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. So our gathering prayer. O God, the Son, highest and holiest, who humbled yourself to share our birth and our death, bring us with the shepherds and the magi to kneel before your holy cradle, that we may come to sing with your angels your glorious praises in heaven, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, God, world without end. Amen. to light our candle. Just try and put it where it's not going to burn me or burn the ferns. Lord, by the song of the angels, you disclosed your birth to your own people. And by the leading of a star, you revealed your glory to strangers. Teach us to know you now and to make you known to all. Amen. I'm going to use Psalm 100. Just a, a very short psalm to begin. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So our reading, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. And I'm going to read this through twice, so perhaps just listen as I read it through the first time and then um, as I'm reading it through the second time, um, note down in the comments a, a word or a phrase or an image that particularly struck you or indeed any comment you'd like to make. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Beth... And they, uh, dear me came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why do you need it? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll be back here, it will be back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Just give you a moment to think about that while I have another sip of tea.
So Mark 1 to 11 for a second time. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied in a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Just give you a moment to comment and for me to read your comments with the slight delay that we have. Yes, Jackie, it, it is a, it, it, I mean, it's the Palm Sunday reading, isn't it? Um, hence my palms. Um, but we're simply going back to reading through Mark's Gospel before we went to, um, before we went into looking through Isaiah for Advent, we were working our way through Mark's Gospel. So we've gone back to where we picked it up and this just happens to be where we've started again. That's a real theme, isn't there, coming through in your comments about just the longing to be in a group. The idea of a huge crowd of people all shouting in the streets. Um, the image that comes to mind is something like that um, victory parade um, in Liverpool in the summer or, or you know, when the Queen goes on walkabout and everyone's sitting there waving their flags. Um, uh, as, um, as Margaret says, even just being able to meet with 12 friends and, and go out and stay the night together, having a dinner, eating and drinking into the night. We're really missing that, aren't we? Um, and there, there is something about this time which is making us... I'm not saying that this has happened for this reason, that, that's, that's not the way um, I, th I think things work, but if we're going to count what small blessings there are or what silver linings there are, there is something about making us recognise the value in things that we would take for granted. I don't think any of us um, a year ago would have read this reading and picked out the fact that they were able to be with their friends or the fact that they were able to be in a crowd as a, a notable thing about it. Isn't it fascinating how our context changes the way we read um, the Bible and the way that we notice things? And as somebody picks up, it, it's very interesting that he just goes and orders for this cult. And I mean, it's basically you know, carjacking in the middle of the street. And I, I have always assumed that there probably is something, um, some sort of pre-arrangement has been made um, and someone has offered this and there's something behind, behind this. Um, Jesus' reputation has clearly gone before him. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why the Pharisees are so worried about him. So I think when he says the Lord, or, or whatever he's using here, the expectation is that people will know that he's referring to Jesus. And I guess it might be like, you know, if you think one of your favourite celebrities, although you think, well, who would just let someone take their car? Actually, if 
if one of your favourite celebrities, a footballer or a pop star or or somebody, you know, um, I won't name names because each of them will probably um, be meaningless to someone else. But if you think, if somebody came up and said, oh, X needs it, can we just borrow your car because X needs it today and they'll send it back? There probably are people who, if that was said and you recognise the people as being part of their entourage, you would accept um, and you would let them borrow it and actually be honoured to let them borrow it. So I think that's the kind of mindset we're meant to be in here. And yes, of course, I mean, we've been talking about crowds and how unusual it is, but as Karen points out, and as we so often note at Easter, the same people who cry Hosanna. Well, certainly a crowd shall it cry, cries Hosanna, and then a crowd is quick to, to cry crucify. Is it the same crowd? We don't know. Probably. There are certainly probably some renter folk people there. Um, who just go along with the mood of the crowd. And I think there is a really stark warning here. And we think of the events um, in America um, and how easy it is for the mood of a crowd to take us along with it and for our own echo chamber, the phrase we use now, to make us assume that everyone is thinking the same thing and to go along with it. Um, and there's certainly a, a call here, isn't there, for us to re-examine who we're listening to and what crowd we're in. Do we want to be, you know, I think there's something inevitable. I think we often hear this as being, we should stand out, stand against the wisdom of the crowd. Actually, I'm not sure how possible that is. Um, the more I read about psychology and things, the more I, I realise that actually, our illusion that we can make up our own decisions it is just that, it's an illusion. And so I wonder whether that's part of what it is to be part of a Christian community, rather than simply going, well, I can say my prayers on my own. That actually it matters what crowd you choose to be part of. Um, and if you surround yourself with people who recognise Jesus as Messiah, it's much easier to confess that. If you surround yourself with people who just want to kill anything that threatens their comfortable way of life, then that's what you're going to be influenced by. And so the choice that we need to make is which crowd that we put ourselves in and putting ourselves into a healthy and life-giving group of people so that we amplify the bits of ourselves that we want to amplify. Thank you for all your comments um, and for that discussion about the liturgy as well. So perhaps at that point, let's move to our prayers of intercession um, and particularly pray for um, for those people and those, those echo chambers and those crowds that we are particularly worried about at the moment. Uh, as Sally points out, that churches and Christian communities that have been, that, that are and have been toxic and damaging. Um, the influence of social media, the influence of, of, of normal, old school print media. So let us pray. Do please pray, uh, add your prayers into the comments. I'm going to light some candles. Um, to symbolise our prayers. It's not even on this one. I'll put this candle at the foot of the palm branches and, and branches cut from the fields. And we pray, Lord, for wisdom and discernment in choosing what crowd to follow, in surrounding ourselves with people who will amplify the truth and the goodness and the generosity that's in our nature, and in stepping away from crowds and situations and people which will close us in and foster hate and division. We pray for all those who are in 
unhealthy or toxic crowds. We pray for all those who were swept up in the, um, in the anger and hate that Donald Trump has fostered. We pray for freedom for them from that. We pray for all those in cults, all those who are in damaging religious communities or groups or churches, which cause them to hate or despise parts of themselves or other people. Open our eyes, Lord, to the power of crowds and help us to choose wisely. Lord, hear us. As we think about crowds um, and the awareness that we've been given this year of the dangers of infection in crowds in a very physical sense, not simply a, um, in terms of our thought processes. We pray for all those who are lonely, for all those who have been infected by COVID, for all those who are living in fear of it. And for all those whose lives have been impacted by it, for those in schools and universities, for those whose jobs are insecure or just really unpleasant and dangerous at the moment, for those who are hungry, praying for the work of our food bank and for all others in our communities seeking to help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the fear that it caused uh, among those responsible for keeping the peace in the town. We pray for places around the world that are suffering from unrest, civil war, disaster, and for all those in government and authority that they may keep the peace and work for the common good with clarity and discernment about what actually is a threat. We pray for all those millions of people in refugee camps or in transit around the world, for displaced people and particularly for those who have been displaced for decades and are stateless that a solution may be found. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
and we pray for healing. We pray for all those working in our hospitals, exhausted and demoralised. We pray for all those named in your prayers. And for all those who suffer in any way, in body, mind or spirit. Give them, we pray, Lord, the joy of your presence in the midst of the valley of death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's join all our thoughts and prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to use the version that's in our Christmas to Epiphany order of service. If you don't have that to hand, or if you prefer, just use whichever version you know best. Divine Mother, Divine Father, to be in you is to be in heaven. May we hear the wonder that echoes in your name. May we accept no rule but the rule of love. May we never tolerate the evil of hunger. May the hurts we cause be forgiven and the hurts we receive be healed. May we remember that we are fragile and cherish the life we share with all. For all love and life and power is the gift of the Spirit. Amen. For our Epiphany blessing. May God the Father, who led the Magi by the shining of a star, lead us also in our pilgrimage to find the light. May God the Son, who turned water into wine at the wedding feast, transform our lives and make glad our hearts. May God, the Holy Spirit, who alighted on Jesus at his baptism in the River Jordan, pour out her gifts on us who have come to the waters of new birth. The blessing of God, the word, the womb and the wind be with you and remain with you always. Amen. So let's join together in our probably now familiar closing affirmation. In the circle of God's love, we are one. The circle is never broken. In the light of God's welcome, we are one. The light never goes out. Let children teach us the wisdom of play. Let neighbours teach us the gentleness of care. May the circle surround us when we are apart. May the light draw us together again. Amen. Yes, I echo Janet's words. Thank you all for being the right crowd to be in. Have a blessed day and Louis will be here tomorrow. Bye.